Hello friends, press the subscribe button and hit the bell icon for more such easy videos. Excretory products and their elimination. Here excretion basically means three important alphabets S, C and E. When I use this word S, basically S stands for separation, C stands for collection and E stands for elimination. So excretion is generally a special type of process where there is separation taking place, collection taking place and excretion taking place of what? Of the nitrogenous waste material. So what is, what is basically excretion? We can say that excretion is defined as the process of separation collection and elimination of metabolic waste or that metabolic waste can also be called as nitrogenous waste. So excretion is the process of separation, collection and elimination of metabolic waste product which are specially in the form of nitrogen outside the body is called as excretion. Like we clean our house every day our body also needs to be cleaned like waste is generated in the house in the same way nitrogenous waste is generated in the body. So all these nitrogenous waste first it has to be separated then collected and then eliminated out of the body. This is what is excretion. Let's look at the organs performing excretion means there were different different organisms and they have different organs but for humans the organs performing excretion are kidney, lungs, skin and liver. These are the organs for excretion. There are two types of waste normally generated in our body. One is volatile waste and another one is non-volatile waste. Volatile waste means in the form of gas. So it will be carbon dioxide and water that is generated and it goes out through the nose. Non-volatile waste, it is going to include urea, uric acid, ammonia etc. These are all non-volatile waste which are removed out of the body via the process of urination. When we talk about excretion and ejection, these are two different terms because most of the time students are confused with these words. The moment I talk about excretion, remember it is the process of removal of metabolic waste. But in ejection, it is the process of removal of non-metabolic waste. In excretion, the waste is nitrogenous waste, but in ejection, the waste is undigested and unabsorbed food. It is not a metabolic waste. Excretion, waste travels from cell to cell, crossing all the cell membranes. But in ejection, waste never travels from cell to cell, crossing the cell membrane. Starts from the mouth. If it is not getting absorbed, it will come out through the anus. So waste travels in the elementary canal. Excretion will always regulate the body pH, temperature, fluid concentration, everything will be regulated. But in ejection, nothing like this is regulated. So there is no regulation of body fluid, pH or temperature. So this is very basic difference between excretion and ejection. Excretion is removal of waste, but ejection is removal of undigested and unabsorbed food, the food which we it was not absorbed. Let's look at the significance of excretion. Why excretion has to be done? Very first reason excretion removes the waste which are not only useless but also harmful and toxic to the human body. Excretion is must because if this waste gets accumulated then it leads to severe disorders. Excretion always removes excess of water and salt from the body. More water you will urinate, more salt you will sweat. Excretion always removes pigments, foreign substances like drugs, toxins, etc. Medicines that you eat, the harmful part is removed by excretion. Excretion is also responsible for regulating the pH of the body fluid. The pH of human blood is 7.4, so it has to be regulated. It is regulated by the mechanism of excretion. This is all significance of excretion. 
so excretion was the process of separation collection and elimination of nitrogenous waste from the body let's look at the excretory organs in different different animals that we normally study so here what i will be talking about the animals we all have studied this in kingdom animalia animals like sponges hydra ascaris earthworm mollusca cockroach platyelminthes all this we are going to see the excretory organ and it is very much important as far as mcqs are concerned and even it comes in your neat exam so let's start with the first one sponges they are going to excrete out through body surface they have small pores called ostia hydra excretes out through special cells ascaris excretes out through rennet cells earthworm excretes through nephridia mollusca excretes through organ of bojanus when we talk about man man normally excretes through kidney but to be very much specific it is the nephron cockroach they excretes through molfigian tubule platyelminthes via flame cell frogs they excrete through kidney fishes they excrete through gills prawns through green gland and spiders they excrete by coxal gland so these are the different animals and their excretory organs which is very important for mcq so remember all these animals but most important remember man mollusca cockroach prawn so it is kidney in cockroach it is malfigian tubule in prawn it is green gland and in spider it is coxal gland for mollusca it is organ of bojanus whenever we talk about marine birds like albatross albatross is a marine bird which you normally see near the sea shore or ocean they spend their entire life near the ocean or in the ocean how this marine bird the albatross manages salt of water it means the marine bird will drink the ocean water only but still it helps it can regulate the salt how so these birds albatross they have a specialized glands called as salt glands which are present near the nostrils and when they drink water through their beak they remove out or they secrete out excess of salt through the salt glands by active transport when as active transport there is involvement of energy example sea turtle marine iguanas they also have managed to maintain the salt in their body let's talk about the different types of animals that we normally see in terms of excretion so whenever it comes to animals you need to remember one thing there are two types of animals one is osmoconformers second is osmoregulators when as osmoconformers it means they are also called as regulators it means they regulate they have the potential to maintain the condition they are isoosmotic to surrounding example fish osmoregulators means they always maintain their internal environment constant like us no matter whether we are in the ocean or in the river the amount of salt in our body will always remain constant and it is purely because of osmoregulators since we show homeostasis mechanism so when as osmoconformers remember conformers are those that can change their body salt concentration as per the surrounding but when i say osmo regulators they maintain internal environment when we use this word conformer conformers basically are of two type one that can tolerate a very narrow range of salt concentration it means if the salt concentration changes in very little amount then they can manage they are called as stenohaline and those conformers which can tolerate high range of salt variation they are called as urihaline so you have two important terms here the first word is stenohaline and the second word is urihaline so salt sometimes it's with respect to temperature also so when they maintain narrow range of temperature it is called as stenothermal and if they maintain high range of temperature they can tolerate they are called as uri thermal so remember steno means narrow uri means wide 
let's talk about the next important part it is about unicellular animals how they excrete like amoeba so amoebas they don't have any specialized organ as such and they are not very complex they are very simple animals so this amoeba which is very simple in nature it is going to excrete out by the help of contractile vacuole given the cell membrane so they have contractile vacuole nucleus and the food vacuole present the contractile vacuole plays two important role one is in excretion second is in osmoregulation excretion is removal of waste and osmoregulation means they maintain water and salt so in unicellular organisms remember students contractile vacuole plays an important role we have nephridia there are two types of nephridia one is called as proto nephridia and other one is called as meta nephridia when i say proto it is network of dead end tubules example flame cells these proto nephridias they are found in animals which lack true body cavity it means they are pseudo coelomate an example for this we have platyhelminthes so the platyhelminthes has proto nephridia for excretion examples some more are rotifers even in some annelids and amphioxus you get proto nephridia when i say meta nephridia it means these are unbranched coiled tube that connects to body unbranched coil tube that connects to body cavity and it is connected through a funnel like structure so this funnel like structure is called as nephrostome and this nephrostome will be opening into outside of the earthworm so when i talk about meta nephridia you can say that the body fluid it passes into the nephrostome from the nephrostome it goes into the nephridium from nephridium it travels into the nephridiophore finally it is out of the body so this is the pathway for nephridia an example for this meta nephridia is earthworm one of the true segmented animal it is meta merically segmented so there are two types of nephridia proto nephridia in platyhelminthes and meta nephridia in earthworm so don't get confused between these two nephridias when we talk about the modes of excretion this is very important topic and we need to remember it in detail one one line is important modes of excretion mainly there are three amonotelism ureotelism and uricotelism when i say amonotelism ureotelism uricotelism there are certain points to be kept in mind and those points will be used in all the three amonotelism so what is amonotelism i can say the process of excretion of nitrogenous waste in the form of ammonia is called as amonotelism so whenever there is excretion of ammonia or excretion of nitrogenous waste in the form of ammonia it is called as amonotelism the organisms which are excreting ammonia they are called as ammonotelic organism so all the animals which are excreting ammonia they are ammonotelic organisms the formula for ammonia is nh3 whenever we talk about ammonia you have to remember ammonia is highly toxic and it cannot be stored in body so it has to be removed as it is formed in the body so ammonia is highly toxic must be eliminated as it is formed in the body 1 g of ammonia basically requires large amount of water to dissolve so 1 g of ammonia will require 500 ml of water to dissolve it means these animals must be surrounded by water since they are surrounded by water i can say that they are aquatic in nature ammonia formation requires a very little energy and ammonia basically it occurs ammonotelism is seen in all the aquatic animals the fishes they are ammonotelic they produce ammonia since it is highly toxic it is removed out of the body as soon as it is formed and 
it requires high amount of water to dissolve excess of amino acid it goes in the liver and finally it follows a step called as a deamination and finally ammonia is formed example we have amoeba scypha hydra unio prawns salamander tadpole of frog we have bony fish we have earthworm etc how to remember all these examples so just to remember all these examples i will give you one simple shortcut and with that shortcut you can easily remember the names of all the animals that are included under a monotelism so the shortcut to remember about a monotelism is suburb pets what is suburb pets s stands for scypha u stands for unio b stands for bony fish a for amoeba h for hydra p for prawns e for earthworm t for tadpole and s is salamander when you talk about ureotelism so all those points that we have written for ammonotelism same point we are going to use for ureotelism also by changing certain important terms so when we talk about ureotelism what logically it means the first point will be the definition the process of excretion of nitrogenous waste the process of excretion of nitrogenous waste in the form of urea is called as ureotelism this is very important part so ammonia excreting animals are called as ammonotelic or a process is ammonotelism urea excreting animals they are called as ureotelic so look at this process of excretion of nitrogenous waste in the form of urea is called ureotelism the organisms excreting urea are called ureotelic formula for urea is nh2 c double bond to nh2 urea is less toxic it can be stored in body for some time but when we talk about urea it requires less water to dissolve 1 gram of urea requires 50 ml of water to dissolve urea formation requires more energy and it occurs in all terrestrial animals all the land animals or will have be excreting urea when we talk about the examples of urea so the examples that we can use it will be mammals mammals are the very good example when we are explaining about ureotelism excess of protein first they are broken down into amino acid then the amino acids are converted into ammonia ammonia enters into the liver and it forms what ornithin it undergoes ornithin cycle to form urea so remember amino acid to ammonia the step is deamination and this ammonia in the liver will follow a very important cycle called as ornithin cycle to give you urea example for this ureotelism we have cartilaginous fish we have frogs we have turtles alligators mammals like camel man etc the shortcut to remember is cm fat cm fat is for urea so c for cartilaginous fish m for mammal f for frog a for alligator t for turtle these are all ureotelic when we talk about uricotelism uricotelism means uric acid so how we will write process of excretion of nitrogenous waste in the form of uric acid is called uricotelism the organisms which are excreting uric acid are called uricotelic organisms formula for uric acid is c5h4o3n4 remember uric acid is least toxic so it can be stored in body for long time uric acid requires least water to dissolve so 1 g of uric acid will dissolve in 5 to 10 ml of water uric acid urea formation require uric acid formation requires far more energy uric acid occurs or this uricotelism is seen in all desert animals or aerial animals like 
for example birds they are aerial they excrete out uric acid it is formed by a process the process is called as inosinic pathway ammonia was formed by um, deamination urea was formed by ornithine cycle uric acid is formed by inosinic pathway the examples here we have insect land snail birds reptiles etc the shortcut for this is ribs where it has reptiles birds snail all these becomes the example so whenever it comes to distinguish between you can use these same points process of excretion of nitrogenous waste in the form of ammonia ammonotelism urea ureotelism uric acid uricotelism the organism excreting ammonia ammonotelic organism urea ureotelic organism uric acid uricotelic organism formula for ammonia nh3 formula for urea nh2 c double bond o nh2 formula for uric acid will be c5 h4 o3 n4 ammonia requires more water to dissolve 500 ml urea less water to dissolve 50 ml uric acid least water to dissolve 10 ml ammonia is highly toxic cannot be stored in water urea is less toxic and uric acid is least toxic so all these points you can use for distinguish between point is how these excretory wastes are produced so first when we eat carbohydrate carbohydrate we have glucose glucose will undergo oxidation and it will form carbon dioxide and water as a waste so this waste is eliminated out of the body so and when we eat proteins excess of proteins basically excess of proteins they are first broken down into amino acid then those amino acids will travel in the liver and in the liver what happens ammonia is formed by a process of deamination and if the reaction continues further what we say that this ammonia combines with carbon dioxide in the liver will undergo ornithine cycle and it will form urea enzymes that are required for this ornithine cycle is arginase this enzyme arginase will catalyze arginine to ornithine and urea formation this we will see in the cycle later nitrogen bases we all know that inside the cell there is a nucleus nucleus has dna the dna is made up of purines and the pyrimidines that is adenine guanine cytosine and thymine adenine and guanine these are purines and these purines when they are broken down they will follow inosinic pathway and then they are converted into uric acid so remember formation of urea protein formation of uric acid nitrogenous base that is purines adenine and guanine formation of ammonia will also be protein so these are the three different types of methods basically for carbohydrate it is never lost in the urine we excrete out the waste through nose and the lungs that is carbon dioxide and water so most important point deamination ammonia ornithine cycle urea inosinic pathway uric acid next what we have to learn there is something called as dual mode of excretion there are some animals which excretes two types of waste depending on the environmental conditions and the factor earthworm they excrete ammonia as well as they are going to excrete urea now the conditions where they are going to excrete ammonia or where they will excrete urea ammonia they will excrete only when they are in moist condition urea on land frog they excrete both ammonia as well as urea but ammonia is excreted in tadpole stage and urea is excreted in adult stage when we talk about lung fish or african toad they again excrete out ammonia and urea ammonia is excreted under normal condition but if they undergo hibernation then they will excrete out urea so it is depending on the adaptation different modes of excretions are there when we talk about crocodile crocodiles normally they excrete urea if they are in 
on land and they excrete out ammonia if they are in water so mostly crocodiles they are in water so they will excrete out ammonia but urea and uric acid is excreted only when they are on land so these are the different dual modes of excretion when we talk about the next part that is called as urea following ornithine cycle how the ornithine cycle will look like what are the different chemicals involved in the ornithine cycle let's do that carbon dioxide will combine with the ammonia in the body and that will combine with carbomyl phosphate ornithine is a chemical which is present so carbomyl phosphate combines with ornithine and it will form a special chemical called citrullin this citrullin basically will combine with aspartate and when the citrullin combines with aspartate it forms arginosuccinic acid this arginosuccinic acid gives out fumarate and it forms arginine now this arginine when it combines with water it gives out urea so arginine combining with water gives out urea and forms again ornithine this ornithine will again combine with carbomyl phosphate forming citrullin citrullin combines with aspartate forming arginosuccinic acid and the cycle is on remember arginine citrullin half of the reaction of ornithine is completed in mitochondria and half is completed in the cytoplasm so uric acid is produced by degradation of uh, purine purine like adenine and guanine they are degraded and finally we get uric acid but it is nucleoside which is getting degraded not the nucleotide we have the next part that is called as rare types of nitrogenous waste when i say rare types of nitrogenous waste it means that these waste are released by only certain group of animals not all so when we talk about rare type of nitrogenous waste first is guanine the process of excretion of nitrogenous waste in the form of guanine is called as guanotelism the animals that will excrete guanine they are called as guanotelic organism animals like scorpion spider and penguins they are considered as guanotelic so guanine is excreted by only three type of animals scorpion spider and penguin next we have amino acid some of the animals they excrete out amino acid also as the nitrogenous waste like unio and starfish some of the animals they will excrete out hippuric acid so hippuric acid is first of all broken down it will form benzoic acid and glycine we have creatinine creatinine is also a rare type of nitrogenous waste so whenever we talk about creatinine it's formed due to the breakdown of muscles during starvation it is formed during fever or even it is formed during hyperthyroidism if the thyroid gland becomes more active then it results in the creatinine formation there is a rare type of nitrogenous waste called as tmao trimethyl amine oxide so this trimethyl amine oxide basically is secreted by mollusca and the crustaceans crustaceans can be prawns or even it can be lobsters or crab these are all crustaceans the next type of nitrogenous waste is allantois now the allantois as a nitrogenous waste is secreted by the mammals it is purines and pyrimidines basically that are involved in case of allantois purine will result in the formation of uric acid and pyrimidine basically will result in the formation of alanine and isobutyric acid so this is a rare type of nitrogenous waste there are many animals which excrete out guanine amino acid and all allantois what exactly happens here in mammals the purines and pyrimidines they are first converted into allantoin and then it is excreted out this condition is seen in case of fetuses young babies that are present in the womb of the mother they will excrete out allantois let's talk about the next important term that is osmo regulation when i say osmo the word osmo means osmosis or osmotic concentration osmotic pressure regulation means to regulate 
So what will be the definition for osmoregulation? I can say the process of maintaining or regulating water and salt balance of the body is called as osmoregulation. The regulation of the osmotic pressure of the body fluid is called as osmoregulation. Means here the amount of water and salt that has to be present in the body, it has to be present at fixed concentration and in fixed amount. And the part of the brain which is responsible for regulating the water and salt is hypothalamus. However, in 1902, he mentioned that reabsorption takes place by two ways. One is salt absorption, other one is water. Salt absorption is under the impact of hormone aldosterone. The aldosterone of adrenal gland. Adrenal gland is a gland present on the top of the kidney. When we talk about water, so water is released or it is absorbed under the impact of ADH hormone. What is ADH? Anti-diuretic hormone, which is also called as vasopressin, and even it is called as pitrestin. So this is a reabsorption of water and salt. So remember, whenever we talk about salt, the hormone will be aldosterone. And whenever we talk about water, the hormone will be ADH, anti-diuretic hormone. ADH is controlled by hypothalamus. See, we all know that the pituitary gland is a master gland. But still, pituitary gland, even though it is the master gland, it is in the control of hypothalamus. So I cannot say pituitary is the master because it is in the control of hypothalamus. And then the pituitary gland will control all the different glands. Let's talk about the next important part that is how do freshwater fish and the marine water fish excrete. So remember, freshwater fish, they have specialized cells called ionocytes or even they are called as chloride cells. So these ionocytes or the chloride cells, they are present in the gills that help in regulating the water and salt. So water salt balance that we see in case of fishes. So very first, we will try to draw two fish. One is the freshwater fish and other one is the marine fish. So let's draw the freshwater fish. Freshwater fish means what? They are in the river and salt concentration in the river will be very much low and the salt concentration in the body of the fish will be very much high as compared to the water. So this is freshwater fish. But the moment I talk about marine water fish in this condition, the concentration of salt in the water is very much high as compared to the concentration of salt in the fish body. So under both these conditions, how these fishes manage to take water at the same time, how they excrete out, that is what we are going to see next. So in river, salt is less. In fish body, salt is more. In ocean, salt is more. And in fish body, salt is less. So these are the two conditions. Let's understand how fishes excrete in river as well as in the ocean. And how they maintain their water and salt balance also. That is what is called as osmoregulation. So remember, fish body is hypertonic as compared to water. And marine body fish is hypotonic as compared to water. So in freshwater fish, they have to face two problems. Very first problem that they will face is gain of water, how to drink water. And second problem that they will face will be loss of salt, how they can lose out salt. And in ocean or marine fish, the problem is gain of salt and loss of water. So it is kind of vice versa thing. And they have developed a specialized mechanism for this. The fishes, they will not die. They will develop some specialized mechanism by which they can drink water and they can eliminate salt. So let us take this. We are taking the freshwater fish. So this is the glands, the system, gills that are present. These are nothing but the fins of the fish. Now, 
let me just copy paste for you so that things become double and we don't need to draw it again and again very first in the freshwater fish you will observe that there is no intake of water they don't take in water through the mouth no even the nacl basically it enters through the gills so nacl and water enter through the gills but not through the mouth and is excreted out through the anus but in marine water they take in water through the mouth but they will not excrete out through the anus they will excrete out through the gills so this is how they regulate the water and salt so remember fresh water fish no intake of water through mouth but marine water fish the intake of water is there through mouth in fresh water through gills enters the nacl and water but in marine water through gills water and salt is lost so this is how the fresh water and the marine water fishes regulate themselves let's talk about the significance of osmoregulation now when i use this word osmoregulation we all have seen that it is maintaining water and salt balance of the body so first significance is that the osmoregulation maintains water content and it regulates the osmotic pressure of body fluid so whatever amount of water is there in your body it will be regulated osmoregulation prevents the cell of the body either from swelling or from shrinking the cell should not shrink or it should not swell it should remain at normal condition equilibrium condition so it is brought by the help of osmoregulation osmoregulation allows the metabolic process to take place in normal way or normal condition even it helps the animals to adapt to the changing environment as the environment keeps on changing the salt and water level also keeps on changing we have one important word homeostasis when i say homeo the word homeo means constant internal constant environment walter cannon in 1932 he talked about homeostasis what is homeostasis we will say process of maintaining constant internal environment irrespective of external environment no matter what is outside my body whether rainy season winter season or summer season i don't care still my body will always maintain a temperature of 37 degrees celsius which is constant this is homeostasis and this is done by the help of hypothalamus so i can say that the hypothalamus plays an important role in homeostasis 